Hey guys and welcome back to the channel. In this video we're going to be talking about this Siemens Nixdorf PCD5T MIDI Tower PC. Now the PCD family stems from the original Siemens PCD computer which was an MS-DOS based system which was kinda AT compatible but not 100%. Now Siemens ended up creating a whole family of PCD PC systems starting from 1986 before being discontinued in 1996. And during that 10 year period, six generations of PCD PCs were created by Siemens, where generation two was based on an Intel 8286 CPU Generation 3 came with an Intel 8386 CPU, Generation 4 with a 486, Generation 5, like the one that I have here, came with a Intel Pentium processor, and Generation 6 came with Pentium Pro-based CPUs. Now, during the creation of these systems, the Siemens Office PC department merged with a company called Nixdorf, so hence Siemens Nixdorf was born as a company. Now, my fifth generation model, the Pentium one, is a PCD5T, T standing for tower, so this is a MIDI tower, which was kind of positioned as either a professional workstation or even a server. The computer came with a tape drive, five and a quarter inch, two empty five and a quarter inch drive base, a three and a half inch disc drive, some LEDs, a power button, and a key lock. That's basically it. And it also came with this cool sliding door. Now, in terms of width and height, this PC definitely has an advantage over the traditional clone-based systems. You can see it's very well made, it's very sturdy, it's very heavy. So this is some serious stuff that we have here. Moving to the back, we have a very basic system. So we have the power supply with a power supply fan, power input, power output. Here we can see the panel which contains two PS2 ports for keyboard and mouse. We have two serial ports and we have one parallel port. In terms of expansion cards, we see what appears to be a SCSI adapter, a VGA connector, and some kind of external floppy drive or tape drive connector, I don't know. So let's fire her up. And when we start the computer, I was happy to say that it did in fact start and we got something on the screen. So we appear to have 16 megabytes of RAM. We have a real time clock failure, so we need to take a look at that. We have a fixed disk configuration error. Then it loads up the Adaptech SCSI controller. It finds a Connor hard drive and the Tanberg uh, tape uh, drive, but then it fails to boot. So yeah. That's a bit of an issue. Now, opening up the PC wasn't as simple as it looks. There are no visible screws and I had no idea how to slide these side covers off. There are two handles here, one on each side, but I just couldn't get the panels off. And then all of a sudden it came to me that this top panel, we could basically slide it away to the side, lift it up, and that would reveal the mechanism to remove the side panels. Now on the top cover, we also see some model information here. So this is the PCD5TA PCI60E. So PCI being a PCI based system, 60 probably means the processor speed. So I'm guessing Pentium 60 megahertz. Now to remove the side panels, we just need to pull it off like so. And then we can access the motherboard. The motherboard does contain some fancy LEDs here at the bottom. No idea what these mean, but I always like these kind of things on motherboards. I also really like the color of this motherboard. It's kind of a special greenish color. And I also really like the layout of this motherboard. It appears to be very clean. I also spot some EISA slots, an ISA slot, and then some PCI slots. But 
The culprit here that prevents the computer from booting, I hope, is the real-time clock failure. So let me get some of these SCSI cables out of the way. And here you can already see what the problem will be. That's right, it's this Dallas RTC chip. Now, luckily, this is a socketed version. Most cases, these things are soldered onto the motherboard directly. But being that this is a professional machine, I guess they uh, kind of thought ahead and they realized that this thing would need to be replaced at some point. So they provided a socket for it, which I am very grateful for. Now, you can still get these Dallas uh, RTC chips from uh, component providers like RS Components. So they are pin compatible. I do have this DS12887A, which has an additional reset pin, but it is backwards compatible with the uh, chip that came off the computer. So we're gonna be replacing it with this brand new chip and we should be good to go. So yeah, replacing the Dallas chip is very simple. We just need to make sure that we respect the orientation of the chip, but then it's just a matter of plugging the chip into the socket and booting the machine and see if the error has disappeared. So we get the memory count. And we still get the real-time clock failure. So that's a bit of a bummer. We get the SCSI controller, and in this case, it's no longer finding any disk drives, but it does say that the time of day isn't set, and we need to run the setup program. So that makes sense, right? We've installed a new real-time clock, so perhaps we just need to set the time and date, and then everything will be fine. But how do I get into that setup program? I tried virtually every combination on the keyboard that resembles entering a BIOS. So that means delete, control, alt, escape, escape, F1, F2, F10, but nothing seemed to work. So I was unable to get into the CMOS setup of this thing. Now, because this is a non-standard AT style system, perhaps this thing doesn't come with a built-in CMOS setup program. Perhaps you need to download some kind of Siemens setup utility on a disk and boot from that. So I decided to uh, go on the internet and see what I could find. And I found this EISA configuration utility where you could in fact set the date and the time. And that got me thinking that, okay, so perhaps there is no built-in CMOS setup. So I need to do everything using this setup. But that also didn't work because it said that the system configuration of this computer was password protected. So I couldn't move further. Now I was actually looking for an operating manual for this PC, hoping that it would give me some additional insights on how to get into the CMOS setup. But apart from a couple of Google entries, I didn't really find a lot of information on this machine. I even went as far as to ask Siemens if they still had some manuals and they actually did reply to my Twitter question. But also have to give kudos to all of the great people in the retro community on Twitter and vintage computer forums that really helped me out in uh, getting some uh, additional files and documentation for this PC. And it turns out that all of the manuals and BIOS updates are still available, but not on the Siemens website, but on the Fujitsu website. Now, Fujitsu Siemens Computers was a uh, company founded in 1999, and it had a 50% stake in uh, Siemens. And so here I was able to find the operating manual for this PC and it did contain a piece of vital information that I was missing and that is the magic keyboard combo to get into the CMOS setup. And once we got into the CMOS setup, this looks very familiar obviously. We can set stuff like disk drives, hard disk drives. We can configure the peripherals like the serial ports, the parallel ports. We can also assign interrupt uh, mappings to the PCI slots and that was missing and that was causing the Adaptec uh, Scuzi BIOS not to load properly. So now fingers crossed and let's hope we can boot this computer. So we get the memory count. We don't get any errors anymore, so that's good. 
Our SCSI adapter will hopefully find the disks now, which it does. Really good. It has installed the BIOS, so it should be able to boot from it, and it does. So we have the SCO Unix System V386, and we can boot into SCO Unix. So this is really, this is really cool. Now, I probably won't be able to enter the system because I don't have the root password, but I am looking forward into uh, hacking into the system because I think that will be possible to reset the password. So here it's asking for a disk check, which makes sense. So it's going to check the hard drive now. I already checked the hard drive using the Adaptech uh, SCSI utilities and it has verified the media uh, okay. So I'm not expecting a whole lot of issues here, but this is kind of the standard thing that you need to do on Linux and Unix file systems. If you turned off the machine or something, then it will ask you to do a disk check. Um, so normally everything should be fine here. It has remounted the file system and it will continue with the boot process. I am getting some uh, no space on device issues. So perhaps the disk is full for, for one reason or another. So it's probably attempting to write some files on there and the disk is full. So nothing much I can do with that at this point. Uh, here I can decide to go into single user mode, but then I need the root password or I can type control D to proceed with the normal startup. Now, I don't have the root password, so I can't really do anything at this point except hit control D, which will continue the boot. But before we continue looking at the software, I did want to look at the hardware also. And the machine was really dirty, so I decided to remove all of the panels, the side panel here and also the front panel of the machine because I wanted to give it a good clean. Uh, if you're working on these types of uh, computers and they are really dirty, the best thing to do is just to get these panels off and clean them. And as you can see, this machine has been heavily used. A lot of dust has accumulated on the machine. So yeah, this is definitely in need of a good cleaning. It's pretty gross if you look at it. So yeah. I also noticed at some point as I was turning on the machine that this disk drive made this horrible sound and it was definitely coming from this disk drive so I don't know if it all of a sudden broke. I did read somewhere that Siemens use these kind of low quality disk drives. I don't know if this is related or if it's just related to all of this dust that has been building up on the machine. So yeah, but there's definitely something wrong with the disk drive that we will need to look at. But for now, I'm just going to take it out and same for the tape drive. Not really sure if I'm going to be able to use or test this as I probably don't have any tapes for it. And with this out of the way, we can already remove some cables like the floppy drive cable, the SCSI cable and get a nicer view of the motherboard. Let me first get this hard drive out of the way. So this is a SCSI 50 pin Connor hard drive. Here we have the CPU. So yeah, really nice motherboard layout. I like the color scheme of the, the motherboard. It uses a standard AT style power connectors. So two of them are needed to power the motherboard, but I do see three connectors on the motherboard itself. We have some cables here probably for the power LED and the hard drive indicator. So let's take a quick look at the cards that we have here. So here we have the PCI Adaptech SCSI controller, has an external and an internal connector. On the ISA slot, we have a video card. So it's, yeah, it's pretty strange to see an ISA video card on a Pentium class machine. So I'm guessing that this computer wasn't really used for anything graphical. It's a Cirrus Logic uh, ISA uh, VGA card. So yeah, pretty standard stuff. And at the bottom here, we have an unidentified card in an eISA slot. So I need to figure out what this is for. Now, this is one of those cases which contains a lot of screws inside. So we need to unscrew a couple of screws before we can take this side panel down, which actually has the motherboard in place.
I'm just going to be removing some connectors here. So this is for the front panel, the power LED. This is for the chassis fan. And then we can just pull this side panel down to get a closer look at the motherboard. So let's take a look at the motherboard, shall we? This is kind of an ATX style motherboard, but it doesn't really look like most of the ATX motherboards I've come across. I really like the layout of this thing and I really like that it's very clean and tidy. I also like the green color of the PCB, it really stands out. Now initially I couldn't really find a lot about this motherboard because I was looking for the PCD5T type, but when I started looking for this actual number which was printed on the silk screen of the motherboard, I did finally found some additional information. So this motherboard seems to accept only the Pentium 60 MHz CPU, maximum memory 192, 256 kilobytes of level 2 cache. Here we have the layout of the motherboard, which is always handy, the various connectors, and also some documentation regarding the dip switches which are on this motherboard. Now nothing really special here except for some password related stuff and getting the motherboard into recovery mode if, for example, updating the BIOS went wrong, some memory information, but that's basically it. So let's take a quick tour at what we have here and let's start with the external connectors. Now on this motherboard, we have limited connectors. We have a parallel port, two serial ports, a keyboard and a mouse connector. That's basically it. Moving along, we have four E ISA expansion slots, one normal ISA expansion slot, and three PCI expansion slots. Now the brown connectors that you see here are the E ISA slots, the black one is the standard ISA slot, and then the three white PCI slots. Now E ISA was used in kind of more professional grade workstations and servers. I don't think that this computer came with an E ISA card, it's just a standard ISA card that was put in an E ISA slot. We also have some LEDs on this motherboard, so that's always nice to see. I don't really know what they mean, but it is pretty cool to have them. In terms of power, we have three power connectors here, but only two are used. So these appear to be standard AT style power connectors. And according to the color codes of the PSU, this is the case. We have the Dallas uh, real-time clock chip here. So luckily it is in a socket so we can easily replace it. I mean, a lot of the times this is soldered onto the main board and it is a real pain to desolder them put a socket in and then replace it. But I mean here, kudos to Siemens for providing a socket on this motherboard. On the motherboard we also have two IDE connectors, a floppy drive connector and I think an additional serial port connector, not really sure. IDE channels weren't being used because we had a SCSI interface card and only the floppy drive cable was attached here. We do have this collection of dip switches here, which I showed you earlier in the documentation. So this is mostly related to CMOS password stuff and recovery modes. Here we have the CPU. We don't have an active fan, we just have a heat sink. So let's take a look at what we can find on the CPU. I'm not going to be removing the heat sink, but this is a Pentium 60 MHz CPU from 1992, 1993. I wonder if this one contains the floating point unit bug. Perhaps we'll find out later. Moving along, we have some level 2 cache chips here, 256 kilobytes. We have some memory modules here, so 16 megabytes in total. So that's 4 megabytes per module. Notice that they are still pretty dirty. And we have two additional free SIM slots to expand the memory. We have a PC speaker built onto the motherboard. It's one of those piezo speakers. And then we also have some connectors for the chassis fan. Don't really know what this one is meant for, but this one here is for the front panel LEDs. 
Now let's take a look at the expansion cards. We have the Adaptec SCSI controller, 2940, very popular card, PCI. So yeah, it's not that surprising to see a card like that in an enterprise grade system, workstation or server. Uh, SCSI hard drives are known to be uh, a lot faster than IDE hard drives and you found them often in these types of computers. What we have here is an ISA card and this is actually a uh, serial uh, card. So this connector here holds up to eight serial ports. Uh, it was located in an E ISA slot, but I'm guessing this is a standard ISA card. The video card was also a 16-bit ISA card, Cirrus Logic. So yeah, obviously this computer wasn't used for any type of gaming. I doubt that there were any user interfaces in the Unix environment either. So yeah, that's why they probably went for an ISA card like this. And now we come to the really sad part of this video. And that has everything to do with this Connor 540 megabyte SCSI hard drive. Now I had put everything, all the parts of this computer in the garage because I wanted to do some cleaning. I had left the hard drive on a table and as my wife entered the garage with groceries, she kind of bumped into the hard drive, hard drive fell on the floor and suffered irreversible damage. So uh, I literally saw this happening in front of my eyes. I also am partly to blame because I put the hard drive in a very awkward position. But after the fall, the hard drive uh, wouldn't complete its boot cycle of Unix anymore. And also in the Adaptec uh, SCSI uh, utility, uh, I was unable to verify the hard drive medium correctly anymore. So yeah, that's a real shame. The plan was to image the hard drive <laughs> to uh, look for the root password, see what was on the file system, see if there were any interesting programs, utilities on there that might give us a hint on how this machine was being used back in the day. So yeah, if anybody here has any ideas on how such a machine would have been used back in the day, uh, please give a comment below. I've heard people um, seeing this machine in action in, for example, uh, hardware manufacturing, PCB, pick and place type machines. So yeah, but unfortunately I won't be able to get into the hard drive anymore. But I am going to put the computer back together. So that involves a lot of screws. We're going to get everything back into the case, including this little bracket here for longer expansion slots. We got the ground lug here and then we can continue with the build. I'm going to hook up some connectors to the main board. Hook up power to the main board. Put all the expansion cards back in. So the SCSI adapter, video card, and serial port. Going to give the Connor hard drive one last try. So hook up the SCSI cable and unfortunately see that it still doesn't work. So time for a backup plan in the storage department. Luckily, I have a number of other SCSI hard drives like this Quantum Fireball or this Fujitsu hard drive or this Hewlett Packard one. So, so I ended up picking the Quantum Fireball and although I was able to play with it a little bit it had a version of Windows 95 installed and I was able to do stuff with it, but all of a sudden it became really, really slow to boot. And I was confronted with the following error messages. I'll leave it up to you guys to Google translate this, but I'm guessing you already know what the issue is. My guess is that this computer was probably used in a sawmill or something, judging by the sound of this hard drive. 
And for those of you who've seen my previous video, you know that I'm not up to the task of fixing this hard drive. And with a failing hard drive in the background, I did decide to continue with this PC for part two. I'm gonna add a new video card, a SCSI CD-ROM drive. I'm also going to be adding some networking, some sound, and hopefully turn this into a nice little Windows 95 machine. Or I could take the SCO Unix route. At one point I received a whole truckload of uh, SCO Unix boxes and I kept most of the disks. So I, I don't know if this is even compatible with this PC or if this somehow corresponds to the SCO Unix uh, system that was on the PC, but I will see if I can kind of reinstall that that original SCO Unix version. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. I hope you stick around for part two. If you like it, please consider giving it a thumbs up, leave a comment, subscribe to the channel. It would really support the channel and I hope to see you guys soon. Bye bye.